So we are ready for the next talk as a former mountain climber. I have to say this is the nicest slide that I could ever see these beautiful mountains. So we are uh, honored to welcome Professor Christian Tretter, who is going to talk to us about spectral inclusions for operators with spectral gaps. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Well, these summits are out of reach for me, but they are can be seen from my office in Bern. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this meeting, in particular, Danielle, Irene, and Daniele very much for the invitation to give a plenary talk here. Um, I also happen to be one of the vice presidents of the IVOTA steering committee, and maybe I can make a general remark at this place. Um, maybe highlighting two colleagues um, who maybe have not been at the very forefront of the IVOTAS, but they are still uh, true leaders in our field in operator theory. Uh, and the first one is Daniel Alpai himself, and I'm really, really happy to see IVOTA uh, now happening at Chapman University. Uh, unfortunately, not in person, but I'm really glad it takes place in spite of all the odds, and I'm very glad to be part of it. Uh, the second person uh, is Heinz Langer, who happened to celebrate his 86th birthday uh, yesterday. And uh, courtesy of Art Dijksma, I can show you another uh, Iwota, in this case 1991 uh, in Sapporo, and uh, you see Heinz sitting in the middle of uh, Harm on the Harm Bart on the left and Art Dijksma uh, on the right. Uh, by the way, also for me, like for Danielle, the Iwota 93 in Vienna was a very important meeting in my career. Uh, as you know, Heinz is not my academic teacher, this was Reinhard Menneken. Uh, but in the now 25 years of uh, collaborating with Heinz, I really had a chance to learn a lot from him. And in particular, our two joint papers on the quadratic numerical range and Dirac operators have influenced my research a lot. By the way, here is a more recent uh, photograph, 30 years, 25 IVOTAs and one pandemic later. So from this sometime this spring, I guess. Um, and also these two papers are uh, related, intimately related to uh, the topic of my talk today, namely operators with spectral gaps. So uh, spectral gaps, very often the term is specifically used for semi-bounded uh, operators, let's say with compact resolvent, and then it's used for the difference of the two extreme eigenvalues, for example, in this case, lambda 2 of t minus lambda 1 of t. In general, a spectral gap means nothing but an interval free of spectrum for a self-adjoint operator. And sometimes uh, people, in addition, mean that alpha and beta should belong to the spectrum. But this is not always the case. Um, there is a number of very prominent uh, examples of operators featuring spectral gaps. And here are the Dirac operators again. Uh, this is a very classical example, then also Klein-Gordon operators and also very classically periodic differential operators feature uh, spectral gaps. And many of these operators have gained importance recently uh, due to uh, their importance for new materials, uh, for example, graphene for two-dimensional Dirac operators or photonic crystals or more fancy meta materials. Now, while all of these operators may or even do exhibit essential spectral gaps, so this means gaps in the essential spectrum, um, which are known to cause trouble, especially when it comes to numerics, uh, the totally unexpected trouble of the undecidability of the existence of discrete spectral gaps in the lattice size limit um, even made it into a publication in Nature in 2015, I think it was. Uh, and this quite uh, shattered the world of theoretical physics because physicists have always thought this is only a problem of mathematicians. Now, in my talk today, which is in large parts, as you saw on the first slide, based on uh, joint work with uh, 
Jean-Claude Kühner, who was my first Swiss uh, PhD student, by the way, and who is now in Loughborough University in the UK. Um, I will present you some general results on operators with spectral gaps that apply both to discrete and essential spectral gaps and that are not restricted to particular classes of operators. And I would like to begin with some very classical results on the first slide, two results that uh, you, many of you, if not all of you will know, uh, and which you can find, for example, in Cato's monograph. If T is a self-adjoint operator in a Hilbert space and S is a linear operator in H, uh, then if S is bounded, uh, just by a Neumann series argument and the control of the resolvent that you have for a self-adjoint operator, it's known that the perturbed spectrum of T plus S uh, deviates from the unperturbed spectrum of T at most by the norm of S. So we would have a picture like, like this. The red spectrum is the unperturbed one. Now, a second result uh, in the monograph uh, concerns semi-bounded uh, T uh, and not necessarily bounded, but symmetric S. So it is assumed there that S is T bounded, relatively bounded, which means that uh, the domain of T is contained in the domain of S and we have an inequality like this here with constants A prime and B prime greater than or equal to zero. The relative bound of S or T bound of S is the infimum of all B prime in here such that there exists an A prime. And we will assume, or in this result, it is assumed that this T bound is strictly less than one. In this case, uh, it is known that the perturbed operator is also semi-bounded and the lower bound, let's say it was bounded from below the original one, then the lower bound shifts at most by this quantity mu T S, which is given in, in Carter's book uh, like that, in terms of the quantities A prime and B prime you have from this relative boundedness condition. By the way, if S is bounded, then you can choose B prime equal to zero here and A prime equal to the norm of S, and then uh, what you get, let me show the picture uh, from this result is that uh, here, this is the shift, which you would also see from here, but you don't get any information here on the spectral gaps. Uh, this is only for the lower bound of the spectrum. A less well-known uh, result uh, is shown on the next slide, namely this is from Gochberg and Krein's monograph. If T is again self-adjoint and now S is T compact. Um, so the shortest way of saying uh, what that is, is to say that S T minus lambda inverse is compact for some and hence all lambda in the resolvent set of T. Then this result claims the following. For arbitrarily small epsilon greater than zero, there exists a radius R of epsilon greater than zero such that the perturbed spectrum lies in a ball around, closed ball around zero with radius R of epsilon. And then uh, the union of two sectors in the symmetric to each other in the left and right half plane with opening semi-angle epsilon. So you can make this sector arbitrarily small at plus and minus infinity somehow, but you pay a price because uh, usually this ball around zero gets larger uh, the smaller you make this, this epsilon. Okay, now uh, what to do if these assumptions are not satisfied? So what if S is neither bounded nor symmetric nor T compact? What if T is not semi-bounded and not even self-adjoint? And what about perturbations S that have some additional structure with respect to T? Well, this is what we will uh, study in this talk, these questions and, and, and the results will concern uh, such situations. Now, before we get started, uh, maybe one remark about this relative boundedness condition. Sometimes it is more convenient to have it in this squared form here. So I call the constants A and B here. And what is important is that uh, 
the infimum of, of all B in this inequality here is the same as the infimum over all the B prime we saw before. So the relative bound can be taken uh, in either of these inequalities uh, as an infimum, it doesn't matter. So you can choose what suits you more. Now, it is uh, uh, also a classical result uh, and an assumption that we will now make that if this relative bound of the perturbation is strictly less than one, then the sum T plus S is closed. I mean, S doesn't have to be symmetric, so we can't talk about self adjoinness but it, it's a closed operator, so it's a, it's a nice operator. Now, our first result is proved under this condition here, but nothing more than that. So if T is self-adjoint, if we have this relative boundedness squared uh, condition and the, in, the relative bound is less than one, so we have at least one of these inequalities here with B strictly less than one, then we know that the perturbed spectrum lies in this region here in the complex plane around the real axis so we can estimate the imaginary part in terms of the real part and in terms of these relative boundedness constants. Um, some comments here. Uh, in fact, we can recover the two classical results from, from this. So first, if S is bounded, we can choose B equal to zero, A equal to norm S. So this region becomes a strip, which is the cl first classical result I showed you before. In general, uh, this region here uh, is a region bounded by two hyperbolas. And the asymptotes of these hyperbolas are, uh, are given by this relation here. So the B, the relative boundedness, um, the constant in front of the norm Tx plays a role here. So we have this pre-factor here. And this is now important to recover the Gochberg-Krein result. Well, uh, if S is T compact, we are in a Hilbert space, hence in a reflexive space. T is closed because it's self adjoint. And then we know that S is T bounded with relative bound zero. So we can now, uh, the, the relative bound is the infimum, so we can take B equal to epsilon arbitrarily small in these inequalities, and then we recover the Kochberg Rhine result from this. Uh, theorem one. Now, in the next theorem, we keep the same assumptions for S, but now in addition, we assume that our self joint operator T has a symmetric spectral gap around zero from minus beta to beta. And then we make the following assumption. If this quantity here formed out of the relative boundedness constants A and B and this beta here, is strictly less than beta, then this gap is in some form retained, but it may shrink. Uh, and it shrinks at most from the left and the right by this quantity mu beta here. Right? So uh, the gap remains open. I mean, S is not symmetric, so one should maybe rather say there remains a spectral free strip, namely this one here. Now, if we put everything together, we get a region like this. So the blue region we saw before, and then there can be a little bit uh, of shrinking of the spectral gap, but the gap condition ensures that some uh, strip uh, remains free of spectrum. Um, for again, we uh, recover another result here from Krasimir Veselich, uh, who considered uh, symmetric perturbations and had a similar result for that. But then, of course, the spectrum was, was real and not complex. Now, uh, if we, in addition, assume that S is symmetric, which we didn't do here, then we can prove more. Because then we can ensure that the circles around these two uh, boundary points of the spectrum, plus minus beta, with this radius mu beta, that they do indeed contain a point of the spectrum if plus minus beta were spectral points, right? So, but that's only possible to be proved if S is symmetric. Now, we can generalize this result to arbitrary spectral gaps, uh, but we have to take into account that 
the gap condition here is not shift invariant. And the reason for this is that this inequality here is not shift invariant. Uh, here you have it at t uh, for zero, but then if you want to have relative boundedness with respect to t minus mu, you have to uh, apply some uh, triangle inequality and then the coefficient, this constant in front of the norm x becomes different. It involves uh, the, the mu again. And so if you keep the gap width fixed, then uh, the gap condition becomes stronger the further away from zero your gap is. So this is the reason that we have this, these inequalities, but it's not difficult to formulate the more general result. So if we have now this arbitrary spectral gap alpha and beta, uh, then the so-called shifted gap condition reads as follows. So the mu beta we had before, now we have the analog, the mu alpha, we have to take the sum of the two and that has to be strictly less than the gap with beta minus alpha. In this case, uh, spectral free strip remains, shrinks from, from the left side by mu alpha and from the right side by mu beta. Now, again, a few remarks here. Of course, in the special case that alpha is equal to minus beta, uh, the two conditions coincide. Uh, then you have the same here, and this is just half the gap width is beta. Um, you can also just divide by beta minus alpha and write this shifted gap condition like that, that this is strictly less than one. Now, this form of the condition is convenient if you want to consider not just one, two, or five spectral gaps, but actually infinitely many. So let's look at this situation. We have infinitely many spectral gaps, and say the alpha ends, uh, they, they tend to plus infinity. So this is the theorem uh, here. So here is the set of spectral gaps, alpha n tends to infinity. And now the assumption that we make is we have this, so to say, this is the quotient from the previous slide, now indexed with n. And if the lim soup now over all these n's, uh, when n tends to infinity remains strictly less than one, then we can prove that t plus s still has infinitely many spectral gaps or spectral free strips. Yeah, so maybe here one should ask, uh, can we satisfy this condition or what are necessary conditions for the gap widths and the relative bounds? And there is a connection. So the necessary conditions, uh, there are two cases. If the perturbation has a T bound strictly greater than zero, then it is necessary that the gap width diverge exponentially, which is quite a strong uh, property, which you rather not find for differential operators. If, on the other hand, the t bound of s is equal to zero, then it's enough uh, that these gap widths diverge. And one such example um, uh, we took from a paper by Brüning, Exner, and Geiler. Uh, they considered point coupled periodic systems of manifolds, and they had all the quantities in their paper. The asymptotics for the gap uh, widths for the widths of the spectral bands, and the asymptotics of the relative boundedness constants a n and b n. And uh, so, with p one q one greater than zero, and these two uh, in R. Um, our result uh, tells that there exists an epsilon greater than zero, such that T plus epsilon S still has infinitely many spectral gaps. Okay, now uh, let's go back to the original results for just finitely many uh, spectral gaps. And let's see if and how they apply to some concrete operators. So I have a number of uh, Dirac examples here, uh, starting with a massless Dirac operator in two dimensions with potential. So here uh, there are the zeros because the mass is zero, h bar and the speed of light are normalized to one here. 
we can add a potential in all the places here in the matrix and we assume that it is not real valued, but it can be complex valued. The free Dirac operator without this potential is well known to be self-adjoint in this product of Sobolev spaces, first order Sobolev spaces. And because the mass is zero, it doesn't have a spectral gap. The spectrum is the entire uh, real line. Now, if we add the potential in LP with P greater than two, we can apply our first result. And not just once, but infinitely often, so to say. Um, let me show the idea of the proof immediately. Um, you can figure out with Hölder and Hausdorff Young inequalities that in fact, we have a whole family of these relative boundedness constants, namely for each T in zero one, uh, you have such an inequality with the constant A equal to this quantity AP here of T, which involves the P norm of the potential, and B, the other constant is equal to T. So this is the result from our theorem one. Now we have infinitely many such inclusions. We take the intersection and that's our enclosure. Now this enclosure, has of course a different form because we took an infinite intersection here. And the next slide shows you the shape of this. Um, for two different P, P equal to five is this upper uh, brighter red line bounding the spectral enclosure. And the brownish uh, region down here is P equal to seven. And uh, so, uh, of course, I, I plotted only two, but uh, uh, the fact is the large, you can also show this, of course, from the inequalities, the larger P gets, the tighter these enclosures get. Uh, this is the worst case. The limiting case P equal to two is the one where the enclosure degenerates into the entire complex plane. And the other, the optimal case is P tending to infinity because for infinite p equal to infinity, the potential is bounded and we obtain a strip that of course we knew before from Cato's result. So this was two dimensions without mass. Now we move to Dirac operators with mass, for example, in 3D, again, with a potential. This is now a four by four actually in two by two block form operator. I normalize the mass and h bar and c to one. This is why we have plus one and minus one here. And again, we add the potential in all the places in, in, this, in this h zero in the end. Here, we now have a gap between minus one and one. And we will come back to that a little bit later. I, I'm just stating this here, but actually we will see a proof of that later. Um, and a uh, proof different from the one that is used in physics. Um, again, self-adjoint in this product Sobolev space. Now here we can apply our result to potentials V satisfying such an inequality here with such a Coulomb type bound here. And if these two constants here, C1 and C2 satisfy this inequality here, then uh, our second theorem tells us that this gap shrinks, but doesn't close. And uh, well, this is the bound for the imaginary part, this hyperbolic bound, in this case, just one. And this is the quantity by means of which the gap shrinks uh, from the original gap. Right. Uh, the proof here, uh, uh, the four uh, is actually the four from Hardy's inequality when you show the relative boundedness of this uh, multiplication operator with respect to the first order. Uh, these are the Pauli matrices, by the way, but the, the gradient, uh, the first order derivative here brings this through the Hardy inequality. Now, before we proceed, I would like to make a little detour um, I remain with Dirac operators, but the detour is that what I'm going to show you now is not proved by means of the results I showed you. It is proved by a biermann schwinger technique. And this is uh, for Dirac operators in one dimension. Uh, this is taken from uh, work of Jean-Claude and, and, and myself with Ari Laptev. 
from 2013. And there are more general results uh, in the meantime, but let me just stay within the one dimension here. So here we have mc squared minus mc squared. Again, we add a potential everywhere and we assume this potential is in L1. Here, the spectral gap is between mc squared minus mc squared and mc squared because we didn't normalize. And by means of this Biermann Schwinger technique, we were able to show that if the L1 norm of V is strictly less than C, then the discrete eigenvalues are confined to two disks in the complex plane. And I have displayed the disks for the case that the speed of light is normalized to one. Otherwise, the formulas are a bit more complicated. So here are the two disks. The centers are mx0 minus mx0 with x0 down here, depending on the L1 norm of V. And the radius is m times r0. And again, another formula involving this uh, L1 norm of V. Now, a few comments on this enclosure here. So the limiting case here, the bad case is C, uh, the C or one in this situation above here, because in this case, the two uh, in the limit, the centers of these two disks move off to infinity and the radii blow up. So uh, again, you in the limiting case, you obtain only the entire plane. Uh, another extreme case is the massless case here, uh, because when m equal to zero, uh, m is equal to zero, you see the the radius here is m times r0. So it's zero, the radius, when m is zero. So this means that there is no complex spectrum at all, even though v is a complex valued matrix potential. So in this case, uh, uh, we obtain that the spectrum of H is purely real. This was proved by different methods for this particular uh, operator already by Seroid in 83. For C tending to infinity, we recover the Schrodinger result, which originally is contained in Abramov, Aslanian, and Davis in 2001. Now, also here, I have an illustration. What happens if the, um, so V equal to zero is, is just this case. The norm of V equal to zero is just the real case with a spectrum uh, on the real line. This is this red, uh, two intervals here. And then when you increase this L1 norm of V from zero to one, you see what happens to the, to the balls, um, to the disks. So the radii move off to plus and minus infinity. Uh, sorry, the centers move off to plus minus infinity and the radii grow. So here you have the different, how these disks evolve when you take V from zero to one. Now, there are further results on general perturbations that I will not uh, go into detail uh, in particular, but is actually very important. All of the spectral enclosures that we have come with resolvent estimates. Then we can also, we have analogs of these theorems for gaps of the essential spectrum. And there are also results for non-self-adjoint T, for example, bisectorial T, um, uh, in, 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 a, in a paper with uh, one of my other PhD students, Christian Wies. Now, uh, in the next uh, section, rather than uh, going into detail here, I would like to concentrate on so-called structured, particular type of structured perturbations. So again, uh, let's consider a self-joint T with such a spectral gap. Then, Clearly, because of the spectral theorem, we can write T as a block diagonal operator uh, in the decomposition of the Hilbert space into the spectral subspace belonging to the interval minus infinity alpha to the left of the gap and the one to the right of the gap, right? And the diagonal elements are self-adjoint. And our structure assumption on the perturbation is that the perturbation is off diagonal with respect to this decomposition of the Hilbert space. So this means S has a form like that. Zeros on the diagonal, and uh, I call the other entries B and C. Uh, 
more generally, uh, um, I mean, I will mostly uh, consider this case with a self-adjoint A and D, but uh, one can also remove this assumption uh, and just consider arbitrary, uh, to some extent, arbitrary operator matrices where A, B, C, and D are just densely defined and closable operators so that the whole thing is still uh, densely defined and closable. Now, let me come back to one of the classical results, uh, uh, namely a result which is not a perturbation result. So again, we assume that our, uh, our self-adjoint operator is bounded below, as on the slide number one, and the perturbation is relatively bounded with relative bound less than one. Now, in addition, we will assume if T is bounded below that S is non-negative then it is actually easy to see that the bottom of the spectrum of T plus S does not shift. It, it is greater than or equal to the unperturbed bottom of the spectrum. So this is not a perturbation result, no matter how large S is, this always remains independent of S. Uh, the reason for this is explained in half a line. It's a numerical range argument. Uh, because if you look at this uh, form here, t plus s x x, you can just omit the s x x because of the sine of s, and that's the proof. Okay, but what about spectral gaps here, and uh, uh, what if t is not semi-bounded? Um, well, clearly, because of the convexity, numerical range arguments can never apply when you want to know something about spectral gaps. So you have to come up with some more sophisticated uh, arguments here. And this is uh, a result from this 2001 uh, paper that I mentioned at the very beginning uh, with Heinz Langer. So it's about a self-adjoint operator with a spectral gap, alpha, beta. An off-diagonal perturbation, as I explained on the previous slide. So we now always assume this structure assumption. And otherwise, as before, um, S T bounded, T bound less than one, and we assume that S is symmetric. Then the claim is that the gap remains unchanged. It does not shrink at all. It just remains as it was before. So this is also not a perturbation result. And it gets even better. Um, this result is independent of the size of the perturbation in quotation marks. It's even true if S is not the perturbation. It's even true if S is the unbounded part and T is relatively bounded with respect to S. And this is, by the way, the result by means of which we can very easily read off all these spectral gaps from Dirac operators. And this is a very elegant proof of these results. You just look at the diagonal element. The original proof of this result uh, used the quadratic numerical range from our 1998 paper, but now in a more general version for these unbounded uh, results. But in fact, the original proof of this result, um, uh, there is a different idea. And this is the idea for that worked very well for bounded B. And the first such proof uh, may be found in Adam Jan Langer's paper from 95. And it uses the sure complement, or some people might uh, omit the lambda here and call it a transfer function. So uh, this is the sure complement, this rational operator function uh, defined outside of the spectrum of D. And uh, what we uh, use here, uh, that under uh, certain assumptions, which are certainly true, uh, satisfied when B is bounded, but also on the more some general assumptions, that the spectrum and all its subparts, like point essential, or you have to be a bit careful uh, with the essential, but uh, the ones that interest us, uh, outside of the spectrum of D, the spectrum of T plus S is given by the spectrum of S1, of this operator function S1. And this is the definition of the spectrum of an operator function here. So you, you can find uh, results in this direction and under what uh, assumptions they, they hold in, in my book. But I would like to show you now this proof idea. So let's take a lambda in this spectral free interval of T. Um, 
then by the spectral theorem, A was this part in the spectral subspace to the left of alpha. So A is less than or equal to alpha and lambda is greater and it's smaller than beta. So we have this chain of inequalities here. Now we write down the form of the Schur complement here. And we uh, move the B as a B star to the other side here. And then we see that this term here is actually non-negative, but we have a minus sign here. So this is less than or equal to the first term. And here we have the estimate alpha minus lambda norm x squared. But alpha minus lambda due to the position of lambda is strictly negative. So the sure complement is uniformly negative and hence lambda cannot be in the spectrum of S1 because zero is not in the spectrum of S1 of lambda. So that's, uh, I think, a nice, nice proof. The other one, as I said, uses the quadratic numerical range. And uh, especially the quadratic numerical range proof allowed us to generalize this result uh, to non self adjoint T. So one such situation is that we assume that A and minus D are uh, accretive, right? So for example, the real part uh, of the numeric range of D is, is here or I should have better reversed that to be <laughs> consistent with, with, the, with the above, but I think you know what I mean. Also here, we have an application. Um, not only does this previous theorem uh, prove all the results on spectral gaps of Dirac operators we saw earlier very elegantly, but it also applies to, uh, for example, Dirac operators on manifolds with S1 symmetry over an M-dimensional basis. Here is a picture for a one-dimensional basis, an ellipsoid. The basis would be this interval. And uh, the function f that will appear in the operator is the radius with which you have to glue together the S1s to obtain the manifold. Then this Dirac operator here is an infinite direct sum over operators dk, which have this form here. Um, so on the diagonal, we have k over this function f and minus k over this function f. f uh, is, is non-negative, continuous on this compact m-dimensional basis. The db tilde is itself a Dirac, uh, well, is itself uh, an operator matrix, let's put it that way. Um, and the entries, an off-diagonal one, and the entries db are the Dirac operators on the basis B. So here it would just be something like I d by dx in the one dimensional case. Now you can apply our uh, gap result to each of these operators dk. And you see that uh, it just tells you that k over the maximum of f minus k over the maximum of f to k over the maximum of f. This is the gap on the diagonal. And then you have infinitely many of these. The smallest gap is for k equal to one. And as a result, uh, you get that every um, eigenvalue, in this case, it's only of this Dirac operator uh, satisfies the bound one over the maximum of this function f uh, on the basis. So this was a, a work with a, a colleague from differential geometry. Uh, she, she had this, this beautiful operator and, uh, but we could only achieve this together uh, because I don't know enough differential geometry and she wouldn't have known enough to, of operator theory. So this was a nice collaboration, I thought. Okay, there uh, is another result, uh, semi-boundedness. Uh, also here, we can benefit of the structure of an off-diagonal perturbation. And the first idea in this direction is actually due to Kostrykin, Makarov, Motovilov in 2007 for bounded T. They employed the quadratic numerical range uh, to prove what, what then uh, was generalized uh, in, in this uh, paper in, in 09 for the unbounded case. Uh, namely as follows. So if T is semi-bounded and uh, the, these are the two spec bottom points of the spectra of the diagonal elements of T. So this was the part to the left of alpha, this was the part to the right of, 
of beta. And uh, in general, uh, you get the following result. If S is symmetric, so this means C is equal to B star in this off diagonal representation. And for simplicity, I displayed this, uh, this only for bounded S in the paper with Jean-Claude. So that, that was in 09. In the paper with Jean-Claude, we also did it then for relatively bounded S, but it wouldn't fit on the slide, this ugly formula. Then we can show that the T plus S, which is then self-adjoint, uh, well, uh, at the bottom of the spectrum of T plus S uh, shifts at most by this quantity here. So this is the bottom of the unperturbed spectrum of T. Then we have the norm of the perturbation here. And then we have this factor here, which contains the norm of S and these two minima of the spectrum of the diagonal elements of T. Now let's have a closer look at this factor kappa here. If sigma A and sigma D coincide. If there is no difference between the, the, the bottom points of the spectra of the diagonal elements, then we have zero here. So we have infinity here as an argument. So th this arc tang is pi over two. Then we have pi over four and the tangent of this is one. So in this case, kappa is equal to one and we just obtain the unstructured classical bound. If however, the two bottom points of the spectra of A and D do not coincide, then this is, this is a, just a finite number. And in this case, kappa is strictly less than one and you get a better result than the unstructured classical bound that you would obtain if you didn't make use. Uh, but of course you have also put more assumptions. You have assumed that S, um, has this off diagonal structure. I mean, you cannot beat a result maybe of Cato without additional assumptions. But anyway, so here is an example for this. A two channel Hamiltonian um, with a Schrodinger operator without potential here. And uh, we've put a harmonic oscillator here in the other corner. Um, so we have the bottom of the spectrum equal to zero for this corner. And here we have discrete spectrum and the minimum is 2n plus 3 when n is in n0. So this minimum point is 3. And OK, this is a, a difference uh, which is greater than 0. And so this is the factor by means of which we can shrink the classical norm v bound in this case. Now also here, there are further results on structured uh, perturbations. Uh, also for unbounded and non-symmetric S. There are also variational principles for eigenvalues in spectral gaps, which uh, I proved in a, in a series of papers with Matthias Langer in, in, in these three different years, also with applications to Klein-Gordon operators and in the presence of complex eigenvalues. And some of these results can also, they do not necessarily require uh, the relative bound to be strictly less than one because you can have some balancing between the columns in such an operator matrix, for example. So that's also uh, relatively new. And let me also emphasize that these gap theorems do also apply to gaps between eigenvalues. I mean, in my pictures, it always looked like essential spectral gaps and for the Dirac operators very often it was but they also have uh, applications just when you want to study how the gaps between eigenvalues uh, change under a perturbation. And this is something that I would like to show you now for a very different uh, application, um, very relevant. Uh, it's uh, for our life because uh, it deals with the so-called magnetohydrodynamic mean field dynamo effects. So these dynamo effects are actually responsible for the existence of magnetic fields in astrophysics, for example, in galaxies, in the sun, or planets like the Earth or solar winds. And there is a whole zoo of dynamo models, uh, alpha squared, alpha squared omega, alpha omega, 
um, uh, we, we considered all of them in a recent paper with, uh, with, with another PhD student, uh, Sabine Berkeley in 2020. But here, I will focus on this alpha squared dynamo model. It is the simplest of these, but it's also maybe the a relevant one because it appears as a building block in all the others. They, all these models are actually infinite operator matrices, but the alpha squared appears then on the diagonal there. And uh, th th this is a result partly, uh, well, we considered it in 2010 with Uwe Günther and Heinz Langer, but the result I'll show you in the end is from some another uh, paper. So this is the basic uh, alpha squared dynamo linearized operator already. So this is an infinite uh, direct sum of uh, operator two by two operator matrices A L alpha L is an integer, and alpha is the so-called helical turbulence function. It models how turbulently this fluid moves, for example, in this conducting fluid moves, for example, in the Earth core. So this is the operator matrix. It has this function alpha, the multiplication operator here in one corner. Otherwise, all other entries are Bessel or Bessel type differential operators in L201. So this is the classical Bessel differential expression here, which we have on both diagonal entries, but with different boundary conditions. In the first component, we have a robber type boundary conditions with boundary condition with L here as a Roppa parameter. And uh, in the second component, we have L equal to infinity, which is the Dirichlet boundary condition. Now in this corner here, we have uh, this Bessel type differential operator where this alpha, this helical turbulence function is somehow mingled in between. Now we know a lot about the differential operators on the diagonal here. Both are self-adjoint, uh, uniformly positive operators with discrete eigenvalues and their sequences of eigenvalues interlace. They are uh, given by uh, zeros of fractional Bessel functions, rather squares of them, as you can see it here. And uh, so for L, you have the eigenvalues of AL and for infinity, you have those in A infinity. So this is the lower bound of all of them. And then we, the, the L, the infinity, the L, the infinity, they always interlace with these strict inequalities here. And this will be important on the next slide. Now it was uh, known to physicists in quotation marks already that uh, this operator matrix has discrete spectrum. Uh, it's not true that uh, just because the entries of this operator matrix have discrete spectra, that also the, res the resulting operator matrix would have discrete spectrum, but here it is the case. And you can also prove this, which we did in, in this joint paper. Now, when we started this business together with this physicist, U Uwe Günther, nothing was known about the eigenvalues of these operators. And so the question is, what can we say? Can we find some regions where, where they lie? And I would like to head for a particular result in the end. There are various ways how you can attack these eigenvalues. And I would like to show you one of them. And uh, to this end, let me display once again this Bessel type differential operator. This is from the previous slide. Now we carry out this derivative here with a product rule. And then we see that we get alpha times the diagonal operator AL, really with the domain also. And then we get alpha prime times the first derivative from the product rule. And what we do now is we carry out a quasi similarity transformation with this matrix here. And the effect of this matrix is that if we omit the second term, it uh, symmetrizes the corners, if you just look at this first part. So before this was alpha AL, and then this similarity uh, transformation distributes the AL equally to these. So these are now adjoined to each other here, really, and have the same powers. And then uh, we have to the rest, which comes from this term here with the alpha prime. Now, this is a very nice decomposition. First of all, uh, these off-diagonal elements have relative bound zero with respect to the diagonal. So this is a self-adjoint operator. 
the first part. Uh, the second part, here we have minus one half of a second order operator and then a first order operator. So this is a bounded product here. And in fact, the norm of this is less than or equal to one. So from these observations, we immediately obtain that this first part here, SL is self-adjoint. So its spectrum is contained in an interval. And this SL, we can get hold of estimates for it by our previous results. The TL, the perturbation is bounded. As I said, this has norm less than or equal to one. So it's bounded by the norm of alpha prime. Therefore, classical perturbation theory, now the very first result we saw, that the spectrum shifts at most by the norm of alpha prime. And it lies in a strip of uh, width alpha prime around the real axis. So th this is just very easy. But now we want to ask a less uh, simple question. Uh, namely, what about the number of non-real eigenvalues? Can we say something here? So in our paper, we have inclusions even uh, better maybe than these ones with other sophisticated te techniques, but I would like to focus on this particular question. So with the results I showed you earlier, we can estimate the spectral gaps between the diagonal elements here after the perturbation in the off diagonals. So that's one thing we can do. And we can also estimate SL with our previous results. So this is something we can easily get. Now, uh, if we put in some more ingredients, namely the asymptotics of the interlacing Bessel zeros here on the diagonal, and the fact that the point spectrum of this operator in the end will be symmetric to the real axis because the coefficients are, uh, are real valued, the alpha here, uh, then we can use the fact that eigenvalues can only become complex when they meet. And if you put everything together, so I, our result of the closing of the spectral gaps or non-closing of the spectral gaps together with the asymptotics of the Bessel series, you know, and this symmetry, then we arrive at this very last theorem of my talk. Namely, if this alpha is smooth enough, C2 in this case, and satisfies such a bound, then we know that the resulting alpha squared dynamo operator has only finitely many non-real and they uh, occur in complex conjugate pairs uh, eigenvalues. Now, this result uh, is actually taken from a bachelor's thesis um, of, uh, from 2017 from, by Thomas Kaeser. And you can imagine if, if somebody can prove such things in a bachelor's thesis, he might go on. And uh, I'm very glad he's now one of my uh, PhD students. But I think we are now approaching the, the end of my uh, talk. And so I would only like to show you at the end the references for my talk. So most importantly, many of the results are, are taken from this work that I mentioned at the very beginning. And most of the others have also appeared already during the talk. So it remains just to thank you very much for your attention.